Hey everyone, welcome to episode 7. In this episode, I'll be discussing the TI-99-4A. If you remember the intro episode, I had one of these when I was younger. It was the black chassis model with the brushed metal accents. The unit I'll be showing off today, though, is the beige variety. Functionally, they are the same, only this model has made some improvements to the motherboard and also simplified the overall manufacturing process to help reduce costs. It is compatible with all previous software and hardware, including floppy drive and controllers. Alright, let's dive down into its history and specs, and then we'll tear it apart. The TI-99-4A, which I refer to as the 4A most of the time, was released in June of 1981 by Texas Instruments, a manufacturer of semiconductors and integrated circuits. Basically, they make chips. It was an upgraded version of the not-so-popular TI-99-4, which was released in 1979. Both were considered among the first 16-bit computers, whereas most of the computers of the time were still 8-bit, such as the VIC-20, which is the predecessor to the C64. The 4A retailed for around $530, which today would be around $1,500. This was still about half the price of the original model. The 4A improved on the original model by coming with a normal, more traditional keyboard, meaning actual keycaps, instead of retaining the original's keyboard, which was similar to the type you'd see on the calculator, little tiny rectangular buttons basically, not very comfortable for typing. It also improved the graphics and made expanding the unit much easier than the original. It did support most, if not all, of the force peripherals while adding its own peripherals. Expansion was possible by one of two ways. The expansion slot on the side, or the use of a peripheral expansion box, or PEB, which was an external enclosure that connected to the 4A's expansion slot. A little bit about the TI-99-4. It was actually part of several projects Texas Instruments had going on along with a game console and a high-end business computer. These are meant to compete with Apple, Atari, and others. The console idea was scrapped and merged with the home computer project, which is why it came with an RF modulator, cartridge slot, and a cheap and uncomfortable keyboard. As with its predecessor, the 4A was manufactured using mainly TI chips, similar to the VIC-20 utilizing MOS chips. For those that don't know, Commodore owned MOS technologies. The 4A was more powerful than other home computers of the time, at least on paper. Its technical specifications were impressive, but due to quote-unquote reasons, okay, architectural issues such as the expansion slot being on the right side, which ended up taking up too much desk space, it never quite reached the performance it should have. It also didn't really get much support from third parties either, with most software and peripherals being released by TI themselves. It also competed with other computers on the market, including the aforementioned VIC-20. This forced TI to gradually reduce the price of the 4A to under $100. Basically, it was a price war going on between Commodore and Texas Instruments. Now, this helped to push systems, but also led to a significant loss of $330 million for TI. Now, I'm not sure if the loss was specifically from the 4A or if other factors led to it. There's a little bit of conflicting information out there, so I don't know the complete answer. But anyway, because of this, TI discontinued the 4A in 1984, though they still supported unit and retailers that had units left to sell, as well as end users. They didn't want to upset retailers because they had other TI products out there, such as calculators. You'd think that since TI used their own chips in unit that they would be able to sustain a low price point, but apparently not. It also didn't help that there was only about 100 software titles available for it, most released by TI themselves. And these were just cheap imitations or clones of popular software, which I'll get to later. During the lifespan of the 4A, a couple of revisions were released, including a cost-reduced model that changed out the black and metallic look for a more traditional beige look. It also eliminated a power LED, though the contacts in the power supply are still there, as you'll see later in the video. The 4A still has a small following of enthusiasts and even has new peripherals and add-ons available for it, including an IDE adapter, USB, yes, USB ports, an upgrade card that improves on performance by including an upgraded CPU, graphics, etc., and there's also an audio card available that includes the C64's SID chip. The 4A had a TI TMS 9900 16 bit CPU running at 3 MHz. It also came with 256 bytes of RAM, known as Scratch RAM, and 16 kilobytes of video RAM, which was accessible to other functions as long as they went through the video display processor. Speaking of which, the 4A had a TI TMS 9918A for NTSC models or the TMS-9929A for PAL models as its video display processor. 
capable of 32 single color sprites at 8x8 or 16x16 pixels. It also supported 40 column mode for text. It did not, however, support 80 column mode, which was starting to gain popularity at the time. It also used a TI TMS9919 for sound, later switching to the SN94624, which supported three voice and one noise channel. It also had a cartridge slot, which was a leftover from its console counterpart. Optional accessories and peripherals include a speech synthesis module, joysticks, tape data drive, floppy drive, an RS-232 serial adapter, a printer, and a 32 kilobyte RAM expansion module, along with the previously mentioned PEB. From a software standpoint, it included BASIC, but not the same version of BASIC Microsoft developed that most other computers of the time used. The 4A instead used a version of BASIC based on Darth Maul, Dartmouth Basic, I think that's how you pronounce it, Dartmouth, whatever. Otherwise, software came on cassette, cartridge, or floppy disks. Okay, with all of that out of the way, let's take a look at the insides. Note, I recorded the disassembly a few months back shortly after I got the unit. This is typically the case for a lot of my videos, but this was kind of a long time ago, so it might be a little bit rougher than some of my more recent videos, which are kind of rough to begin with, but... It is what it is, so... Anyway, let's take a look. Okay, so... TI-99 slash 4A. Um, as mentioned uh, earlier, we're going to open this guy up, take a look at it, make sure everything is in good shape, although I suspect it is, because... If you've uh, seen the uh, pickups video for September, you will you know that it was in pristine shape. Um, So let's get this sucker open. Just a bunch of Phillips screws, fortunately. Shouldn't be too big of a deal. And there we go. That should be it. Let me make sure... Carefully, in case there's any cables or ribbons or anything like that. Oh, that's right. I forgot. This whole thing is actually mounted to the top of the case and not the bottom, like most things are. Well, let's take a look here. Yeah, very, very, very minor corrosion, rust, whatever, but it's not a big deal at all. Um, otherwise, this doesn't look like it's ever been open at all, which is amazing. I wonder how strong this tape actually is, still after all this time. Surprised I didn't use different tape, but it's all right. So it looks like this is the RF shielding here, which, as if you've seen any of my other videos talking about it, it's required by the FCC, but in many cases, you don't actually have to have it. Um, probably should have watched a this assembly tutorial so I knew exactly how to take this thing apart, but let's wing it. Why not? More than likely this has to come out first. This here, some sort of power supply board, which is odd because there's an external power supply with it. I'll have to look up Look this up i'll put a description either overlaying the video or below um but all the capacitors look like they're in fantastic shape i don't see any signs of leakage or bulging or anything i need to get a better magnifying lens and a light but for now this will have to do yeah i don't see anything wrong with this at all I don't like the fact that these two wires are soldered in, whereas this has a connector. Makes it a little bit more difficult to play around with, but that's all right. Let's see. Okay, so it looks like these two go straight to the power supply socket, which is just loose. So, okay, that makes it a little bit easier. 
Let's remove this tape and then I can disconnect. I bet this probably generates uh, different voltages required by different components. The external power supply is probably just, you know, uh, 150, 10, 150, 120 volts to maybe 12 volts off to check the power supply itself. And then it probably comes into here to dish out the positive, negative 12 volt rails, 5 volt and ground and the other voltages that it may need. So we'll put that there and now that gives me access to everything else, which means that I can take these screws out. If you saw the intro video, you'll know that I had one of these growing up, garage sale pickup, but it was the black case with uh, some brushed metal accents. Uh, it came with a few games, cassette player, Hooked it up to an old black and white. What a black, no, maybe it was a color TV. Just like a 13 inch one. I mean, that's how most of these computers at the time were hooked up unless you forked over extra cash to get the uh, official monitors for these machines. Not just this, but like the Commodore and everything. All right, here we go. A lot of bodge wires and I Wondering if these are from the factory. I'll have to look it up and see. And if they are, I'll mention it. If not, then it's possible that the previous owner did open this up and made some modifications. But I don't see anything else wrong with it otherwise. I don't see any blown caps, no bad caps. Um, there's no battery in here to leak, which is a good sign. Everything in here looks pristine. Yeah, I don't see anything wrong with it at all. So it should be relatively safe to turn on and test. I don't have any software for it, so we're only going to get a look at basic. But if that's all I got, that's all I got. Not much else I can do. So it looks like the con these are the controller ports here. Um, and then this here, I believe, is the either a composite video out and RF out and maybe even RGB out, I'm not sure. I don't think so, that doesn't seem like there's enough pins. But this is a multi-use uh, multi port, basically. So the keyboard itself, you know, let's pull it off of the case completely here. Keyboard itself is on a separate board and it's got a ribbon cable connector. Does it just pull up or do I have to? I think it should just pull up. Yeah, there we go. Oop. That's the key I popped off earlier to take a look at the keyboard to see if it was clean or not. And well, it definitely was. There we go. Where does this go back on? There we go. Perfect. Nice clicky keys, like your other old school keyboards. So it rested on these little rubber feet, which the rubber is in really good shape too. It really makes me wonder if this thing was not refurbished already. Um, but I doubt it. I, like I said, I have to check out these bodge wires and see what they do. Um, see if I can find a schematic and trace them out, or at least maybe if this is factory, then hopefully someone will have information. Um, for those of you that don't know what a bodge wire is, well, it's one of these. <clears throat> Basically, it's used from a manufacturer standpoint to make any corrections to the circuitry. Let's say they went, designed the circuitry, put everything in and they realize, oh, we missed a few traces. They kind of make up for it with just these wires real quick, especially if they've already produced a bunch of these before they found the problem. Um, otherwise, uh, they can also be used by enthusiasts for different types of modifications, depending on what they're doing. This one here seems to be going from capacitor to something labeled W1. It's probably for video. It's it's possible that this might have some sort of video mod done to it. I don't know. Um, the shielding itself is soldered directly to the board, so I'm not going to be able to remove it easily. Uh, and I don't really have a good desoldering tool anyway. I pretty much just have a copper braid that I can use to remove simple solder joints. But something like this, because of the fact that PCB's got a lot of copper in it, typically. 
uh, or maybe this one's got aluminum. I don't quite know, but uh, either way, it'll act kind of like it's a heat sink, so it'll absorb the heat. So for me to try to desolder the shielding from the board, it'd be a fu futile effort without proper tools, which I do need to purchase. But yeah, I mean, otherwise, this thing looks like it's in good shape. So I'm gonna put it back together and I'm gonna fire it up and test it out. And if it works, you'll probably see that on video first. If it doesn't, you'll see me back with the circuit board open so we can try to figure out what's wrong with it and see if we can't fix it. And here it is. Now there wasn't much due to it as it was basically in pristine condition. Just a quick wipe. Now because this only comes with an RF modulator by default, I put together this really basic cheap looking AV cable. There is an AV out port on this and it does support composite video. Interestingly enough, the pins for AV out match the same pins on the C64 for composite AV out. Pins 2, 3, and 4 are the same on both. This should also work on some Atari 8 bit computers as well. Now the C64 can also support S video while the TI cannot, so make sure you do not try. The reason is that pin 1 on the C64, which is used for the Luma signal, is actually 12 volt on the TI. I believe this is to help power the RF modulator, though I could be mistaken. Another thing to mention. While I was putting together footage, I started testing the unit by running a simple basic program. I didn't capture footage of that unfortunately, but it did work. However, when I turned it off so I could insert a cartridge, it would no longer turn on. I opened it back up, no footage again, sorry. I wanted to double check the capacitors and anything in case something had leaked or burned or popped or something like that. Everything checked out. I also checked the cartridge and gave it a more thorough cleaning along with the cartridge slot. Still no go. The unit just wouldn't power on even without a cartridge in it. Had I fried my 4A? Well, basic troubleshooting took effect. Check the outlet, breaker, make sure all connections are snug, etc. Then I focused on the external power supply. Yes, I said external for a reason which I'll get to in a bit. But anyway, you may notice this weird little part of the power supply cord, which kind of looks out of place. Well, it turns out it's a fuse. And fortunately, while it's a little bit of a struggle, it does separate itself from the rest of the power supply, exposing your standard North American two-prong plug. So I went ahead and plugged the power supply back into the outlet, and everything started to work again. So, crisis averted. Now, there's no way to really replace the fuse inside of this little box here. I tried, I don't see any screws or anything. It looks like it's basically just like plastic welded together. It's not needed, I checked up in some forums. It's okay, it'll work without it. It was just more of a precaution. So a little earlier, I said external power supply. That's because there's also an internal one as well. Strange, oh yeah. The external one takes 110 volt AC and converts it to 18 volt DC. Then the internal power supply takes that and makes what appears to be positive and negative 12 volt and five volt. Why not just have the external power supply do that? Or just the internal one? Who knows? No, seriously, does anyone know? If you do, please post a comment below. We want to try to clear this up. And as I disassembled the unit again to try to diagnose the power issue, I noticed there was a notch for the power LED that the older models use, but not this one, as well as terminals on the power supply to be able to solder it in. I may put one in sometime in the future, we'll see. This didn't come with it, but the previous one did, and because the notches are there, I kind of feel like there should be one, but I'm not quite sure. I would have to drill into the case, and I don't know if I want to do that. Not to mention some of the pictures of the unit I see online show either a green LED or a red one. Maybe it was a dual purpose LED, I'm not sure. But if I do put one in, maybe I'll jazz it up a little and put a blue LED in there. Or maybe RGB, right? Right? No? Yeah, no, there's gonna be no RGB in this thing. Never, ever, ever. So don't even, don't even comment about it. It's just a joke, a really bad joke. I apologize, please don't hate on me. But I am gonna put tempered glass in here and I don't care what y'all say. Not really. Anyway, the 4A came with a programming guide that contained quite a few samples of basic code. This was to help users familiarize themselves with TI Basic, programming in general, and to kind of give them some software since it really didn't have much.
And if you saw my October pickups video, you'll know that I also picked up a TI-99 programming book with a whole bunch of basic code to play around with. Now there were other types of programming books as well, not just for the 4A, but for the Atari line of computers, Apple, Commodore, etc. I also have a couple of cartridges. TI Invaders, super super original name there, and Pac-Man. TI Invaders is just a clone of Space Invaders that TI made themselves, whereas Pac-Man is Pac-Man. I mean, everyone knows what Pac-Man is. The interesting thing about the Pac-Man cartridge, though, is that it was made by Atari Soft, which, yes, it's just Atari. It's a division of Atari that was created to create software for competing computer and gaming systems. Now, TI also had their own version of Pac-Man called Munchman. Yeah, Munchman. Uh, I'm willing to bet if you Googled that name without including TI or Texas Instruments in the search, you'd probably get more than you bargained for, so don't, don't do it. Anyway, the other interesting thing about Pac-Man is that it was so, so, so much closer to the arcade version than the Atari 2600 version was. I, I still, to this day, don't know how Atari released that and thought it was acceptable. Or that people during the time bought the game and it was one of the biggest sellers on the system. Like, what the heck, you know? So that's it for the 4A. Well, I didn't spend a whole lot of time with my original garbage sale pickup as a team. It did lead to the family purchasing our first actual PC, so the 4A definitely has some meaning to me. And while I prefer the look of the black and metal version, it's nice to have a virtually new unit in my retro collection. It's a shame it didn't succeed in the market because it was more powerful and in many respects a better overall home computer than its contemporaries. But of course, at the time, TI was run as a more traditional business just like IBM was and didn't expect the type of competition it would have from Steve Jobs at Apple and Jack Trammell from Commodore. Now I may revisit the 4A in the future, especially the basic guides. I may try out some of the programs, maybe even modifying them to demonstrate how many early computer adopters learn how to program. I won't go overboard with the changes as I'm not a developer, not even with something as simple as basic. If you liked the video, please tap or click the thumbs up, and if you haven't yet, please subscribe. If you didn't like it, go ahead and hit the thumbs down, but please leave a comment as to why, so that I can use that to make improvements in future videos. Thanks all, and I'll catch you later.